Welcome to Sacrilegious Discourse. I'm husband. And I'm wife. Together we're reading the Bible for the very first time. We grew up without religion and wanted to know what all the fuss was about. Well, what have we learned so far? That God is a dick, and apparently some people believe in talking donkeys? We're not trying to pass ourselves off as experts. Nope, we're just reading the Bible for the first time and giving our first take reaction. If you'd like to join us in this venture, you might consider starting at episode one. Otherwise, jump in wherever you like. All right, let's go read the Bible. Yeah, let's get to it. Husband! Wife! Do you know what we're doing today, right now? Well, it is Sunday, which mm -hmm. means that we're probably doing... Sacrilegious Book Club! That's the one. <laughs> Jesus. Oh my gosh, that yeah. was so enthusiastic. That was like some pent-up Sacrilegious Book Clubbing. It was. Like, it was. It's hell? been a minute. Yeah, so uh, what are we uh, book clubbing today? So we're still in this big old book called A Treasury of Jewish Folklore, Stories, Traditions, Legends, Humor, Wisdom, and Folk Songs of the Jewish People, edited by Nathan Ozubel. Yeah. And, oh, we're in, <laughs> um, I forget what part it is, but it's over halfway through the book. It and sure is. We're doing some folk tales. Folk tales. On page 565 and you you gave a lead in to the last in the last episode mm -hmm. that we did that this might be somewhat relevant to the time period that we're in talking yeah, about yeah. maybe um relevant to the thing that we just read on uh yesterday okay with regard to the maccabees okay that you right. found so confusing yeah i did i did <laughs> just for the record i re-listened to our episode today and i still was confused oh my so. god okay just saying well, okay. Well, then maybe you'll hate this. Who knows? I would not. I, I, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll All right. See. So, are you ready to do this? Yes, I am. All right. Let's do it. Okie dokie. All right. So, I did a quick peek and um, remember when I said, oh, shit, I don't remember what part we're in. Yeah. But yeah, so we are in part four, Tales and Legends, and then of that, we are in chapter four, Folk Tales. Okay. Okay? Yep. And we're just covering the first half of this chapter mm -hmm. because it's about Alexander the Great. Okay. Okay? Which is interesting. Yeah. Okay? All right. All right. So, anyway, like I said, page 565, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to start with the introduction here and then go into some notes that I have. Okay. Okay? Sure. So, the narrative art of Jewish folklore has the liveliness and color of all Eastern storytelling, Jewish, Hindu, and Arabic tales alike. They use all the technical devices of suspense and the surprise ending with much skill, and yet there is a subtle difference that marks off Jewish tales and legends from the other. Mm. Okay? okay. They are more cerebral, turned inward, as it were, and tirelessly pointing a moral for the guidance of men. Okay? So okay. their stories are more moral driven. They say that. They say that. I mean, I don't know how much stock to put into that. Based on what we've read, that's not always the case. Well, I'm just saying, like, you know, obviously this is leaning towards the Jewish take on this. So. Right. I mean, to say that the other religions don't have a moral take is maybe being a little disingenuous, poss possibly. Well, I, I'm I don't not know saying the we, don't, we don't know the other side, so I'm just saying we don't know. I don't know their folklore. Right, right, exactly. So, and that's what I'm saying. We can't got speak. It. That's true. We're, we're giving an opinion based on this right. book. That so is true. That is true. That's Good all call. I wanted to say. This is the character of the didactic tales about Alexander Mukdun. Or Alexander the Macedonian. Okay. Who is Alexander the, the Great. Fucking Great. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So here's where I'm going to deviate from the intro and go into my notes, which include some information from the intro, but also a little bit more about Alexander the Great and the time period to kind of tie it in better with what we were reading yesterday. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it is surprising that. A the G. That's how I. <laughs> what? Alexander the Great. Oh. That's how I um, abbreviated him in my Got notes. It. A the G. Yeah. <laughs> it's surprising that Alexander the Great loomed so large and favorably in Jewish folklore. 
because he had very little contact with the Jewish people, except for that one time. That, that one time? That one time that mm. he marched through Palestine in 332 BCE. Mm. Okay. okay. So, yeah, he did that. Got but it. Was he just passing through? He was just passing through on his way to conquer the world, you know? Got, got it. Yeah. Took it down, whatever. Yeah, right. Um, until the age of 16, Alexander was tutored by Aristotle. Really? Right? Hmm, interesting. So, so crazy, like, all the different people and things that, like... Tie in. Tie in together and that go together. Right, right. Like, I have such a hard time when I'm studying... Like, in school, you only study one culture at a time. Yeah. And then you never come back to it when you study a different culture the next semester, right? And the teacher and the history books, like they never put those things side by side and tell you these things were happening in different parts of the world at the same time. Sure. And that that is why I've always hated history because yeah. I could never understand. They don't tie it together. Yeah. Right. I, and I'm a person that I need all those loose ends right. tied together. Now, I, one of my favorite um, podcasts that – is sadly no longer i don't think they make new episodes anymore as much or at least that like i think they release things from other people or something like that but it's not the exact thing that i liked but npr had a podcast called through line mm, yeah, and yeah. i loved that podcast because they would talk about a, a current issue through the lens of mm -hmm. all of history essentially like they would they would tell you about that incident that thing yeah starting from where it all originated from through current day I it really liked amazing. that one, too. Yeah. yeah it was, it it was, was such a great podcast. It was really good. I liked it, too. Yeah. So this upbringing, being tutored by Aristotle, uh -huh. and his education contributed to his popularity because Hellenism and other Greek culture things yeah. had been infiltrating steadily into Jewish life since the pre-Maccabean era, which, I mean, that makes sense because that's what we were talking about yesterday. The confusion with the Greek culture versus the Jewish culture. Right. You know? Yeah. And yay, they're getting rid of the Greek culture, but also, oh, no, we're getting rid of the Greek culture. Yeah. <laughs> like, they couldn't decide what they wanted. Sure. And so, um, that was happening in Judea and Syria, but particularly into Egypt, where a great Jewish population of more than one million. Wow. Yeah. Had developed a significant Greco-Jewish culture by the second century BCE. It's especially interesting considering God was going to kill them all. Right? Remember? Yeah. If they didn't run away back to Jude Judah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He was going to wipe them all out. And mm -hmm. instead, now they flourished yeah, right. in Egypt. Right. Huh. Crazy how that right? worked. Yeah. Thus, Greek legends about Alexander the Great found an eager audience among Hellenized Jews. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I just, I love. Well, and there was that Greek uh, pharaoh, too, remember? Mm -hmm. So, like, I wonder if that helped, you know, solidify some of those ideas, too. Mm -hmm. so. it, oh, definitely. Right. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, in 335 BCE, shortly after his assumption of kingship over Macedon, Alexander the Great campaigned. I can't say just Alexander. Right. You no, have it's to Alexander say the Great. The Great is his last name. Right. Of you know? course. Yeah. He campaigned in the Balkans and he marched all over the damn place. Right. Okay. Yeah. Gaining control of um, con some countries and then destroying others. Okay. So if he couldn't like make them bend to his will, he, he just like, them. yeah, basically right. bombed them, you know, Got whatever. It. Right. So in 334 BCE, he invaded the Persian Empire. Ooh. Yeah. And he began a series of campaigns that lasted for 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Following his conquest in Asia Minor. Ma Asia Minor. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Alexander the Great broke the power of Persia in a series of decisive battles. Okay. So, I mean, he was kicking some ass. He's pretty great. He was pretty great. I mean, for, you know. That's what mil I hear. Military person. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So after the fall of Persia, the Macedonian Empire held a vast swath of territory between the Adriatic Sea and the Indus River. Hmm. Okay. You know, it is funny to me, though, that we know him as Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. And he apparently was very um, well thought of by Israelites, mm -hmm. which kind of translates into Western culture. Yes. So, like, that idea that he was great from them mm -hmm. is maybe why we think of him as... But, like, if you're Persian, mm -hmm. if, you, if you were from that part of the world or you're Asia like, Minor... He wasn't maybe, so great. <laughs> maybe he wasn't so great. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right? 
He wanted to reach the quote ends of the world and the great outer sea. Mm, okay. Okay. So he invaded India in 326 wow. BC. Damn, he made his way around the world. Oh, he did. He did. He achieved there a very important victory. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, he was sticking his dick everywhere. Yeah. You know. Right. Due to the demand of his homesick troops, he eventually turned back and later on died in 323 BCE. Okay. In Babylon, the city of Mesopotamia that he had planned to establish as his empire's capital. Okay. Which I just, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. we're literally in the place right. that we've been reading about. Yeah. Okay. Alexander's death left a series of military and mercantile campaigns unfinished. Like, he had all these great plans that sure. just kind of fell through when he died. Right. These would have begun with a Greek invasion of Arabia. Wow. Yeah. Wow. In the years following his death, a series of civil wars broke out across the Macedonian Empire, eventually leading to its disintegration. Huh. So he was the only thing holding it together. Right. And then when he died and all his plans Everything crumbled. Fell apart. Yeah. So yeah. he was like a great leader, but didn't apparently have great leadership. Right. To bring up uh, to, somebody to follow him up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So his personality appealed to the Jewish community for multiple reasons, which I have listed here. Okay. Okay. One, he treated his conquered people more humanely and with more tolerance than other world conquerors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Right. Like as long as they bent and yeah, let them be right. in charge. Yeah. Then he was like, all right, cool. Go about your business. Do your thing. Sure. Number two, he allowed Jewish life to continue undisturbed as long as they just let him have world domination. <laughs> like literally. <laughs> I mean, you know, fair like, enough, right? They, right. You, look, how many times have the Israelites been in war, have been conquered, mm -hmm. have conquered others, but like fighting all the yes. time, right? Right. If somebody comes along, they're like, "Hey, you're good. I just want to claim this land." Yeah, I, I just need to write your name here for tax purposes. And then they're like, "But we can do everything we were doing. We're still Jewish, right?" Right. And they're like, "He's like, yeah, yeah." And then, so I mean, they're probably like, "Okay, yeah." Cool. Yeah. And go. I mean, I, we don't want to fight all this. So, yeah. you know, you can on. say you own us. We don't give a shit. We're cool with it. We're always owned by somebody. <laughs> right. OK. So number three, his military genius was astonishing okay. to all. Like everywhere he went, even though they got conquered, they'd be like, but yeah, he is a pretty brilliant leader. I mean, sure. look what he did to us. Yeah. You know, I mean, we still talk about that today. That's like um, I read in one of my notes that. Um, military leaders still to this day study his brilliant campaigns, right? Because he was just such a, a smart um, genius. Genius, military, yeah. You know. Like I'm sorry, I'm fumbling for words because how many different ways can you say brilliant and smart and genius? You know, right, right. But that's what he was. Sure. Okay. Number four, he was a philosopher of the highest pedigree as the Jews had great reverence for Aristotle. Hmm. So they respected that about him. Okay. They're like, cool, cool, cool. We like that philosophy shit. Right, right. Which is funny because they were also like, but philosophy and Greek stuff, tuh, tuh, we don't like that. But, to an extent, but we but, do, though. But there might have been different groups, too, because, yeah. like, I mean, the, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. It's I mean, so know, that's weird hard to because say. they were like, some of them were for it and some of them were against it. And it depended on um, the political reason why and which group of them and which country they were in at the moment. Sure. And, but like, let's take the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Like if somebody were to write a history about this time period later on mm -hmm. and say, well, the, the U.S. had taken a large swing to the Christian nationalist side of things. And that's how the world started. Like that's how they started acting because the government was controlled by that and the Supreme Court and everybody started, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right. But that doesn't mean that we're a monolith. That's In fact, true. you know, most of us don't agree with that. Right. But our government acts as though that's not the case. Right. You know? Exactly. So. All right. Number five, his intellect was admired almost as greatly, perhaps, as Solomon's. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So they damn they didn't so make that comparison. Solomon might have been the wisest, but this dude was like the second wisest. Yeah, <laughs> like they didn't make that comparison themselves, sure. but the way that they write about him and admire him, yeah, it's like they all but say it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So Talmud authors found in Alexander the perfect specimen for their moralizing folk tales. Okay. Because 
even though he was like a brilliant military campaign person and he was really smart and stuff, um, he wasn't Solomon. He wasn't Jewish. So they could also like paint him as goofy. Sure. And be like, oh, that Alexander the Great. Got it. Got you know it. what I mean? Yeah. So one satirical question raised in many of the Jewish Alexander stories is this. How was it possible for a man claiming to be a philosopher to be so lacking in wisdom and virtue as to pers pursue such destructive and senseless ends as wars of conquest? I, I mean, you could say the same thing about the Israelites at certain points during their, mm -hmm. you know, earlier years. Yeah. So I don't. That, how, how indeed. <laughs> maybe, maybe look inward a little bit. Right. So. Right. So many Alexander stories in the Agata and other Jewish literature, yeah. which there are Alexander the Great stories in the Agata and in Jewish literature. Sure. That just astounds me. Yeah. I don't know why, but I, that just came unexpected to me. Right. Um, they come straight from Greek tales and legends. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the three that are included in this section that we're going to read today. Yeah. Um, those three are Jewish in origin. Okay. Okay. So the other ones were influenced by other stories. These ones are strictly Jewish and Jewish created. Okay. okay? Yeah. Um, the second one is derived from the Talmud. The okay. second story that we're going to read came from the Talmud. And the third one first appeared in the Agata. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get into these stories. And they're all pretty short. Okay. And none of them are too brilliant. I just thought that, that, that makes for a natural breaking point in the chapter yeah. to talk about Alexander the Great and then read those three stories. And then we'll do the other ones next book club. Okay. Okay. That right. are not Alexander related. Sure. Sure. Okay. So we start with the great are also little on page 566. Okay. This one, when I read it, sounded kind of familiar. So I've either heard this specific story or one inspired by it. Got it. Okay. Um, this is page 566. The great are also little. No matter how much he achieved in the world, Alexander still remained dissatisfied. I would like to experience something most unusual that no human being before me has ever experienced, he cried. So he ordered his hun hunters to capture a number of eagles. Nobody ever captured eagles like that before. <laughs> Just kidding. He chose the largest among them and sat himself astride it. Hmm. You couldn't be very big if you could sit even on a large eagle, is my opinion. Right? Um, you can't be a very I, I large know. person. People, I think people were a little bit smaller back then. They were shorter. So. Like, Lincoln is supposed to be, like, super tall, but then if you, like, actually look at his measurements, I think he was only, like, 5'10". Right, yeah. Some shit like that. Well, have you ever walked into, like, old houses from, like, the yeah, 1700s? Yeah, yeah. Like, the doorways are so much lower. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. Right? Yeah. It's almost like evolution or something. You know? It's almost like that. Yeah. Right? Interesting. Interesting. Right. Yeah. So maybe they could fit on eagles back then. Maybe. Okay. So he sat on this fucking eagle. He chose the largest among them and sat himself astride on it. Then he speared a piece of flesh onto his lance and raised it high. As soon as the eagle smelled the flesh, it rose up in the air, straining to reach it. Purposely, Alexander held the flesh out of reach of the eagle, who rose ever higher and higher into the air. Alexander the Great rode a fucking eagle. He rode a fucking eagle <laughs> into the sky, yeah. Called bullshit, but okay. I mean, it's not a bad way to ride an eagle. If you're going to ride an eagle, that's the way to it do it. If it was at all possible, yeah. I mean, That's how I'd ride a dragon. Sure. Yeah, you know? just dangle some meat in front of it. Sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. Soon the towns and cities began to look like pinpoints to the king. Alexander was filled with vain glory. Who can compare to me now, he gloated. I am higher than all men. In my eyes now they look like insects. Mm. And I'm like, you're brilliant. And nobody else would ever do that. Right. Right. Like now that they've seen you do it, though. You're not great. You were just the first one that did that. And maybe not the first one, but just the first one that we know about. I mean, let's just be clear. He didn't do this. Oh, right, right, right. No, okay. totally. And no one, you can't ride a fucking eagle. No, you can't. Okay. Right. You, their bones would not support no, you. No, no. But suddenly fear gripped him. Uh, he yeah. thought, if I am so high up, how can people see me? Maybe I also look like a fly to them. You do. Perhaps they don't see me at all. And if I am out of sight, how can they do me honor? Soon they may even forget me. 
Like, <laughs> uh, when it said that suddenly fear gripped him, I thought it was like, if I fall, fall from this right. height, I yeah. will surely die. But no, it's because he's going to be forgotten. What if they don't like me anymore? Well, if they're going to forget you during the course of a flight on an eagle, right? you know, you got some bigger issues, man. Yeah, I'm just like, I, I think that your priorities are a bit confused, <laughs> my guy. And all his pride burst, and his uniqueness seemed as nothing to him now. Mm. And still the eagle kept soaring farther and farther from the earth. Once more, Alexander looked down, and the earth now seemed to him like a little ball. Oh, whatever. Okay, Jesus so he, he flew that eagle up into space, is right, what they're yeah, trying to no, tell like me. Past the moon, even. Yeah, yeah. The king grew frightened, and he lowered his lance with the flesh on its point. Straining to reach it, the eagle began to set, descend over lower and lower. Soon objects became distinct, even larger and larger, towns, trees, and people. And the nearer he came, people grew bigger and bigger to his eyes. Hmm. And Alexander rejoiced and derived the right moral from it. Mm, okay. What, okay. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. When he reached the ground again, he ordered a sculptor to fashion a portrait of him holding a small sphere in his hand. Let people know, spoke the king, that even the mighty Alexander can look as insignificant as this tiny sphere. Well, that's... That that's, is the good moral, but I don't think if they see you holding that, what that looks like is you saying, I was bigger than the world for a minute. Right. The world was as nothing but a little ball while I was high in the sky. Yeah. Like... I somehow think that maybe... Or, or like, you know, I hold the the world in the palm of my hand. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, um, I hear your words, but your your picture that you're asking to be painted doesn't match. Right. I maybe think you didn't get the right moral. Right. Yeah. That's just my opinion. Sure. Okay. So the next story begins on the next page, 567, and it's called The Lord Helpeth Man and Beast. Okay. And I liked this one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. During his march to conquer the world, Alexander the Macedonian came to a people in Africa who dwelt in a remote and secluded corner in peaceful huts and knew neither war nor conqueror. They led him to the hut of their chief who received him hospitably and placed before him golden dates, golden figs, and bread of gold. Okay. Uh, do you eat gold in this country? asked Alexander. I take it for granted, replied the chief, that thou wert able to find eatable food in thine own country. For what reason, then, art thou come among us? Your gold has not tempted me hither, said Alexander, but I would become acquainted with your manners and customs. So be it, rejoined the other. Sojourn among us long as long as it pleaseth thee. Okay. At the close of this conversation... Two citizens entered as to their court of justice. The plaintiff said, I bought this. I bought of this man a piece of land. And as I was making a deep drain through it, I found a treasure. This is not mine, for I only bargained for the land and not for any treasure that might be concealed beneath it. And yet the former owner of the land will not receive it back. The hell? The defendant answered, I hope I have a conscience as well as my fellow citizen. I sold him the land with all its contingent as well as existing advantages and consequently the treasure inclusively. Wow, this is a very uh, honest people right? that he they're, came across here. Yeah, they're very nice to each yeah. other. Like They're going to court to fight over who. Who gets the gold, <laughs> not me. <laughs> right, right? Yeah. It reminds me, there was this episode of The Simpsons where Lisa and Bart were arguing over who loves Homer more and um, at first, you're like, oh, that's cute. They're like, you're thinking that they're going to be like, I do, I do. But then, no, they're actually saying, you do, you do. <laughs> 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 I'll never forget that. That's what this reminded me of. Yeah. Okay. The chief, who was at the same time their supreme judge, recapitulated their words in order that the parties might see whether or not he understood them aright. Mm -hmm. Then, after some reflection, he said, thou hast a son, friend, I believe. Yes. And thou, addressing the other, a daughter? Yes. Well then, let thy son marry thy daughter and bestow the treasure on the young couple for a marriage portion. Mm. Which I didn't like the arranged marriage right, bit. Right, right. But, but given customs back then and the time and yeah, what have you. And they were like, well, yeah, that's great. Um, Alexander seemed surprised and perplexed. You think my sentence unjust? The chief asked him. 
Oh, no, replied Alexander, but it astonishes me. And how then, rejoined the chief, would the case have been decided in your country? Right. Ooh, to confess the truth, said Alexander, we should have taken both parties into custody and have seized the treasure for the king's use. What? <laughs> that's out, that tracks. That's that's a bit harsh. Like, why are you bringing this foolish fuck? thing? I guess. Like, either y'all split the gold. Well, they would have been fighting to keep the gold is a thing. Yeah. And so if they went to court over it, they would be like, solve this problem. Right, right. So, I mean, yeah, that tracks. Yeah. For the king's use, exclaimed the chief, does the sun shine on your country? Oh, yes. Does it rain there? Assuredly. Wonderful. But are there tame animals in the country that live on the grass and green herbs? Oh, very many and of many kinds. Mm -hmm. Aye, then that must be the cause, said the chief. For the sake of those innocent animals, the all-gracious being continues to let the sun shine and the rain drop on your own country, since its inhabitants are unworthy of such blessings. <laughs> I liked that one. I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> Basically, he's like, your people suck. Yeah. Like, it's amazing. I have amazing. a feeling that, that some, you know, Alexander the Great, being a conqueror and all, mm -hmm. wouldn't have much appreciated that uh you know, disparaging remark toward him. Um, I don't know, because the way he's presented in this story in particular, like, he doesn't say he disapproves. Right. He was right. specifically asked, do you disapprove? Yeah. He's like, no, actually, it's fine. Sure. Like, he didn't. He And they do refer to him as a philosopher. So maybe yeah. he was willing to take in new ideas. You yeah, know? I I think that he was just like, wow, that's actually really cool. We would never do something like that. Right, right. Like, I think he kind of admired it. Sure. Like, that would never fly in my country. We'll never be like that. And I am going to, you know, conquer you. Right. But still, cool, cool, cool. Good story, bro. Right. Okay. Last one. Ready? This mm -hmm. one is on page 568, and it's called The Acquisitive Eye. And I did kind of like this one as well. Okay. This one's more philosophy driven. Yeah. After he had conquered the entire world, Alexander started back on his journey home to Macedonia. On the way, he came to a stream. He dismounted and taking out some salted fish he carried in his knapsack, he began to rinse them in the water before eating. At this, a remarkable thing happened. Upon touching the water, the fish became alive. I mean, that's not entirely surprising. Right. Like, you know, that can happen. That can but, happen, yeah. But in this story, it, it is magic. Sure. Okay. Okay. Filled with amazement, Alexander threw himself into the stream and bathed in it. <laughs> now I understand, he cried overjoyed, that the water in this stream flows from paradise. Wow. I will wash my face quickly in it, and then I'll follow the stream, for it's sure to lead me to paradise. Mm. Barely had he finished washing his face when his eyes began to shine like stars. His face became radiant. His energies renewed. Wow, I need to swim in right? this water. Yeah, where is this place? I don't know, but I'm hoping it would help me lose some weight. Right. Never before had he felt so happy. Quickly, he went up to the gates of paradise, but he found them closed. Mm. Open the gates, he cried out. Alexander wants to answer. <laughs> I mean, enter. Right. Like, could you imagine, like, marching up to a gate and saying, your name wants to enter? I mean, he was a conqueror, so maybe he just felt entitled to go into whatever. Trump would say it, like, referring right, to yeah. himself in the third person all the time. Sure. Open the gate, husband. Wife wants in. Right. Like, what? Right. That's not how we talk. Yeah. Instantly, the answer came. These are the gates of the eternal. Only the pious may enter here. Seeing that the gates would not open for him, he implored, Give me some kind of token, O heavenly gates, so that I can prove that I've been here. Mm. At this, the gates of paradise relented and opened for an instant. A human eye then rolled towards him. Amazed, Alexander picked it up and placed it in his knapsack. Then he made his way home to Macedonia. Hmm. No sooner no sooner had he reached home when he called all his wise men together. He told them everything that had happened to him. What signifies the strange gift I received, he asked. Yeah. Oh, king, replied the wise men, place the eye in the scales and weigh it. What for, replied Alexander. I can tell you beforehand that it weighs but little. Uh -huh. like, I just carried it all the way home. It's right. a fucking eye. Sure. 
Just do it just the same, the wise men urged. In the other half of the scales, place a gold piece. Then we will find out which is heavier. The wise men know a thing. Okay. okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay? You can tell. They know what's happening. Sure. Okay. Then we will find out which is heavier. Alexander did as they asked. To his surprise, he found that the eye was heavier than the gold piece. <laughs> He threw into the scales another gold coin. Still, the eye was heavier. Oh, man. He then threw in a whole handful of coins and ordered that all his gold and silver and jewels be thrown in. Mm -hmm. Still, the eye outweighed the treasure. Okay. Even were you to take all your chariots and horses and palaces and place them in the scales, the eye will still be heavier, said wow. the wise men. That's one crazy eye. Right? Yeah. Right? Again, this is a philosophy story. Sure. No, okay? I, know. I know. Okay. Okay. How do you explain this? Asked the king. How is such a thing possible? Learn a lesson from this, O king, said the wise men. Know that the human eye is never satisfied with what it sees. No matter how much treasure you will show it, it will want more and still more. <laughs> Your explanation doesn't satisfy me. Give me proof, insisted Alexander, which I think is fair. Like, mm -hmm. sure. That sounds weird. Like, arbitrary like right. i see that all the jewels are heavier than the eye that is some weird mojo going on right right but just what an odd lesson yeah. that you're no, applying I agree. to I it agree. very well agreed the wise men have all your gold and treasure removed from the scales then place a pinch of dust in their place and observe what happens Barely had Alexander placed a little dust in the scales when they tipped to the other end. Oh, man. For the dust proved heavier than the eye. Hmm. Now I understand the meaning of your words and of what was in your minds, cried Alexander. So long as a man is alive, his eye is never sated. But no sooner does he die when he is as dust. Then his eye loses its impulse and becomes powerless. It can no longer desire hmm. the end. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I thought that was an interesting lesson. Yeah. Like, no, I, I think what I like from it, from the whole set there, mm -hmm. is that um, Alexander the Great seems to be able, he seems like a reasonable person. Yeah. Ish. 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 Right. Like, he conquered lots of people, so I'm, I'm guessing he wasn't all that reasonable. Yeah. Like, but... This you have to qualify your statement. Like it comes with a caveat that given that he was a fucking mass murderer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that's not all that uncommon in uh, ancient times. That especially Shit. we've been reading about it all, like all through the Bible. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it, it's it's almost become a, um, a little bit numbing how yeah. much we read about like just mass murder. Like you just almost forget that. Okay, wait, no. He was reasonable given that he killed entire populations of people. <clears throat> right. Like, he was he was reasonable to philosophies. He was reasonable yes. to um, intellect. And to other cultures' ways of doing things sure. that allowed for equity and equality. Right. Even if he didn't necessarily it, it, practice them themselves, he seemed to respect and admire it. At least according to these portrayals. Yes. So, I yes. mean, I don't want to give him any more credit than he's due because I don't really know that much about him other than Nor he's great. I. You know, yeah, according to... You know, history. He is great. That's so, what we hear all the time about is. how great he is. It is. It's part of his fucking name. Yeah, it sure is. I had no idea he was actually Alexander or anybody else other than <laughs> the great, much less Macedonia. Right, right. That he wanted to make Babylon his fucking base capital city yeah like yeah. that's so amazing so you can see why yesterday i was like y'all gonna want to stay tuned because sure. that history about him just it fit the time period kind of got it all right well that was our is that our book club for today that is our book club for today and next time we will continue that chapter um it'll have more stories uh folk tales but it won't involve alexander okay so that'll do us for today for the Sacrilegious Book Club. Sacrilegious Book Club. And I will be getting out the weekly wrap up out here shortly. Wrap it up out. Yeah, yeah, out I said, that, said too many words there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then we will be back tomorrow with um, Jeremiah chapter 46. All right, we'll see you then. Okie dokie. Bye. Hey, wife. I guess that's the end. But husband, that's just sad. It doesn't have to be. We are on lots of social media platforms like Twitter. Our handle there is sacrilegious underscore D. For D's nuts. Oh my God. Stop doing that. <laughs>
Anyway, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. There's a link to all of our social media sites at our website. Ooh, we have a website? Yeah, it's sacrilegiousdiscourse.com, where you can also find a link to our merch shop. We have a merch shop? Yep. We have podcast-themed clothing, mugs, notebooks, and more, as well as an atheist and science-themed products. Wow, our fans should really go check that out right now. Definitely. They can get in touch with us by sending an email to sacrilegiousdiscourse at gmail.com. But before they do that, we could really use some help. Oh, yeah? With what? Well, it's not free running the podcast, and we need some financial support in order to get better equipment, which will free up time so we can concentrate on our podcast and our fans. Okay, so what should they do? Head over to patreon.com forward slash sacrilegious discourse and sign up as a contributor on our podcast. Supporters there receive additional bi-weekly episodes that we record just for our Patreon members for as little as $2 a month. Also, we'd really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe on whatever platform you're using. And Apple Podcast Reviews help us out tremendously. Like and subscribe. Leave an Apple review. Join us on Twitter. Support us on Patreon. That's a lot of instructions. Don't forget to say thanks. Thanks. Okay, bye. <laughs>